I don't know if you've seen that video in the New Zealand shooting. I haven't. Yeah, I wasn't supposed to see that, but somehow the video got around. And mm-hmm. it's probably, I don't know if the people were getting in trouble for watching it. Or, I don't know. But anyway, I did watch it. I, I, sh- I probably shouldn't have, but I just wanted to to see right. what the, how good this guy was. And uh, it was really disturbing. I mean, he had the AR and he had the GoPro set up around top of his, I think it was helmet or whatever he was wearing. And uh, I think I said this earlier um, on another podcast, but he was going through, you know, room by room shooting people and they were piling up. Right. Their bodies. And then he was going back again and shooting them again in the head. And one guy tried to stop him. You saw him like run up from the left. Right. And he just didn't make it. I mean, he just turned around with the gun and just pulled it up and shot him. But he tried to grab the gun. And, uh, but he was, it was almost like, a, I mean, I watched it once, but it didn't seem like he was just trying to grab his gun. Like he wasn't trying to tackle him to the ground or I don't know. I mean, that's just a shitty situation to be in. Right. So, I mean, poor guy. I mean, yeah, I guess probably to him to even try, but since we're in the mass shooting thing now, kind of backing it up. I mean, I mean, it was terrible to watch. Yeah. Just the AR is such a powerful weapon, you know, since you've had a lot of kind of training in it and whatnot. Right. What can people start thinking of when you're talking about your family members, yourself, if you're in a mall? I know maybe it's smarter for us to take it and maybe you can tell us what if you're in a bar, you know, a room versus a mall. I mean, your options are going to vary wildly there in terms of like being able to run away and hide. Right. The the basics are all the same, though. It's actually now part of, unfortunately, it's part of the lexicon of the world, uh, run, hide, fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we made a um, a video for the public. Uh, called Surviving an Active Shooter. And um, it, it was basically the same stuff, run, hide, fight. But at the time, a organization called Ready Houston, who made the first video for the public, had uh, copyrighted the phrase <laughs> run, hide, fight. Now everybody uh-huh. uses it, but they, we actually got a call saying you can't uh-huh. can't say this in your video. <laughs> so ours is, you know, very close. It's, you know, get out, uh, secure your location, defend yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot more wordy than run, hide, yeah, fight. Yeah, but yeah. but uh, the planning starts ahead of time. And, and unfortunately, we live in a world now where we have to tell our kids, very young kids, I mean, you look at Sandy Hook, so even yeah. at the elementary school level, to know where their exits are, know how to get out of, of a place if something should happen. So um, the the balance that you need to find in that is is not to go into every situation, every public place and, and think a shooting is going to happen. It's just how, how could I get out of here if I have to? Mm-hmm. Um, looking at malls and one of the things that we covered in our videos – we all know where the main entrances are and things like that. But if you have to, if you're in a food court and you have to dive over the counter and go through a back door, right. even look look for that mm-hmm. um, and try to have many, uh, you know, three or four ways to get out of a situation because the the threat could be coming from the direction where you think you're going to go, and that mm-hmm. that's why you should plan ahead. and And it just takes a second when you go into um, if it's a mall, a restaurant. Um, and and uh, and just know how to get out. That's that's the first thing we talked about hostage situations and and the best way to 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 be a hostage is not to be a hostage. Mm-hmm. Uh, the best way to be involved or be in a location where there's an active shooter is is not to be there. Yeah. Um, so that's that's obviously that's that's the first thing that that just all law enforcement and the world is, is you know telling people. Um, the thing that we we find and and you you see it in every. I mean, there's way too many of them, but you know, one's too many. But you always hear someone saying, "Oh, I thought it was fireworks." Yeah, yep. it was a car backfire. Yeah, um, and you hear that so often. So I, I would add to the pre-planning is, who cares if it's fireworks? If if someone laughs at you for running from fireworks, you know, so what? Mm-hmm, uh, yeah. It could, it maybe would not be uh, the the last uh, shooting in the, this area we had was at Saugus High School. Um, I heard a couple of the kids saying they thought they were balloons popping. Jeez. You know, and those yeah. of us in law enforcement know that was mm-hmm. definitely a gunshot. Um, but those who don't hear gunfire often yeah. uh, at the range or wherever, they they don't know. Uh, and when we were filming the scene in, in the mall, uh, we told – we had the actors in the first couple of takes – Soon as the gunshot went off, they everybody scattered, mm-hmm. and we said, "We want you to take a second, mm-hmm. look toward it, and then realize, yeah, this is something that's happening now." Because that's the thing is like, and we've talked about it is like most people, 
aren't necessarily around firearms, haven't seen gunshot, have mm-hmm. gunshots close to them or know what the sounds like or know the kind of the shock of like, what am I seeing right now? Do you recommend people maybe go out? I mean, not to be paranoid about it, but get maybe get trained a little bit, see what it's like. I got, I got to add on to that because yeah. I had, we had a guy and he's like a dad in the city that we lo- that I work in and he brought in a gun to turn in for destruction and he didn't want to touch it. He's like, I found this in, uh, you know, we just moved in this house and I found it. I just had to bring it over to you guys. Can you come check it? So I go out there and I think it's a real handgun he has in his car and it's not, it's a BB gun, Yeah, but it's not even a BB gun. It's like an airsoft. Yeah. Right. And he didn't know how to check it. He didn't know. I mean, very obviously you turn on this little air canister in the bottom and I'm like, my God. And he was probably, I don't know, mid forties. He's like, oh, I didn't know. I I don't know anything about guns or, and so that's what you're kind of dealing with, I think. Right. Well, I mean, the gun debate has got so many different sides to it, but you know, one of them is, you know, guns are the worst thing in the world. And, and, uh, well, we wouldn't have active shooting situations if it weren't for guns, but, Mm. Uh, you have somebody on, in that example you just gave, who's on that side of the spectrum or, mm-hmm. you know, you know, who doesn't want to even touch it or look at it. Uh, I, you know, knowledge is power. And I would right. just suggest to anybody that they at least, you know, understand, uh, you know, what it sounds like and, and understand that, that, that pop that you hear, uh, you know, especially if you're in an urban environment, you don't know what direction it's coming in because the sound bounces off everywhere. And you look to you hear, you think it's to your to your left and it's actually coming from the other side. So awareness is the number one thing. The the knowing where the exits are, realizing when something happens that you quickly have to react. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think so many people are motivated by not wanting to look foolish mm-hmm. that yeah. they yeah. – they they don't want to run or or jump, you know, and and uh, yeah, I feel like I'd be that guy, like yeah, that was nothing, you know, and like being trying to be cool, and yeah. meanwhile someone's behind me, like popping, and we're all guilty of yeah. it. We hear, yeah. you know, the the car backfire, even the gun fire in our own neighborhood, where mm-hmm. you'll hear one round go off, people shoot their guns off for, you know, ridiculously for for New Year's <clears throat> or Fourth of July, mm-hmm. um, but you know, just understanding if it if it continues, if there's multiples. Um, you know, probably going up to the window and looking out isn't, isn't necessarily a good idea. <laughs> um, you know, we, 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 we train people, you know, the, the next part of kind of the formulas is, is hide. If you, if you can't get out and you think that going from where you are right now into another area is, is going to be dangerous, you, you want to shelter in place and, and, uh, you don't want to be near, near the windows cause that's where the threat's going to be coming from. So, mm-hmm. right. um, Somebody told me recently that they've that somebody came up with this, uh, and it, it must be very expensive, but like a ballistic wall that could be, you know, oh. put in classrooms and and on a hinge and and where it could turn a uh, a room. You can divide a room and have it locked down, and, and that's uh, cool. It'll stop because you know that's another thing people don't realize that that bullets will penetrate most building material, yeah. including mm-hmm. especially drywall, even plaster. Um, yeah. you know, if, if they're lucky enough to actually hit a stud, uh, most, most studs, if you hit it, you know, from the length, the, 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 the narrow end won't make it all, all the way through. When I was a cop in, in, uh, up in Northern California for a short time, somebody did a drive-by with an AK-47. The bullet went through multiple homes. It was crazy how far the bullet, I was, I went back days later and they were still finding bullets that buried into their fridge and into like places right. where they finally came to arrest. And I, I never had any experience with that. So I was stunned, like how far those things could travel. Well, like in schools or they, I, they had this new device where you can like, I don't know, it like shuts the door where they can't open it, like in classrooms. But then my thing was like, well, what if they shoot through the walls right. and doors? Yeah. Like, you always hear about people barricading doors with their bodies and holding stuff, but those normally are the people who get right, shot. Right. Um, you know, I've heard said that uh, a lot of uh, uh, bathtubs uh, are cast iron, mm-hmm. and so they've, uh, you know, I, I, I hear a lot of anecdotes about people down in South Central, what they used to call South Central LA, not sure what the politically corrupt term is now, <laughs> but getting into, when they hear gunfire and getting into, getting their kids and getting into the bathtub. And, Jeez. Uh, and that. That's uh, good to know, because I've always thought about that in my home. Yeah. What if there's a drive-by, you know, things are spraying, like, where would I take my kids, you know? Yeah, a lot of the modern bathtubs are more are are because they're cheaper. They're like, yeah, so. yeah. What do you think of these backpacks for kids in like <laughs> school? Like, is that a joke or? I think I, you're the first uh, person who told me about that. We're having a backpack made out of ballistic yeah. material. Yeah. Well, you know, when I think about that, I think about people who were buying parachutes who worked <laughs> in uh, in high rise buildings <laughs> after nine eleven. Yeah. 
you know. Um, I don't know about you, but well, maybe you two. You look like you might be into it, but I, I've, ne- I've never base jumped. Uh, I've never base jumped. No, we so. haven't either. Yeah. yeah. It'd be fun to do, but yeah. I so. just... I don't know. I just, I just see people the the chute opens and runs them right into the building. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then they, fall to earth and I crumple. More, yeah, yeah. So you know, everyone has to have kind of a level of of security in in their mind, and and if that gives you peace of mind, I, I got to imagine they're expensive. Um, they are, you know. Yeah. And then the question is whether you know what age is the is the child wearing it, and do you mm-hmm. want to let them know? Uh, and then how yeah. often. Do you hear about kids being shot through a backpack? You know, exactly. Yeah, I, I wouldn't discourage somebody from getting one. There's probably something that you know I would advocate: spend some money on on spending some time with your family, and exactly, yeah. and that you know that couple of hundred bucks or whatever it costs, you know, take them. Uh, Take them on a you know a day trip uh, or you know mm-hmm. uh, I'll you know take out a second mortgage go to Disneyland <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> enjoy it's so yeah. expensive now yeah. it's crazy that's it's a crazy. that's a day pass right two hundred bucks or a two day it's pass something, it's <laughs> gnarly it's crazy. crazy a season pass now is uh, twelve hundred yeah. for like oh the one that's just minimal blackout dates I was looking to get one and it was like uh, I don't know if I can do that because yeah. now over two years old that it's now not free anymore. I worked at uh, Magic Mountain when I was 16, and I think the the uh, admission price was like 15.95, and uh, uh, that's back when Disney was was still selling the the A through E tickets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we I have we had an old one that was 35 dollars when we were little. 80, wow. I think it was 80, 60, yeah, 85, and it was like the little paper ticket, and it was crazy. But yeah. speaking of Disneyland, that was a place that I always thought about mass shootings, and before they didn't have any security gates, they didn't have any like right. uh, metal well, even detectors. Now, well, even now, now they have still, it, but, but still, you could walk up to that whole area where everybody gathers to get, get checked, and yeah, you could wreak havoc you know? on one of the checkpoints there, and or probably, tossing something over a fence. Yeah, not yeah. to give anybody an idea. Yeah, but <laughs> I might want to edit that out. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know. It, it's it's a fact of life now. I mean, mo- most of us traveled before nine eleven, mm-hmm. and and you know it's it's a lot of us don't remember that where you could go through the airport, and go up to the gate, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and and just um, I used to uh, not to say how boring I am. I used to people <laughs> watch with friends over at LAX, and and you could go into the terminals and and. Uh, you know, then metal detectors and then 911. Of course, you got to take your, your all your clothes off and, yep. and yeah. go through the X-ray. <laughs> I just did that. It was like the whole. You know, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm like God, man, this. It's this crazy. Is nuts. I was just thinking that the other day yeah. when I came down here, I was like, that's just. Do you share those feelings about having things like that at schools? Uh, for, about having like metal detectors. Yeah, and having kind of kind of a locked off campus where you got to go in and out of metal detectors. Because I've been in some schools in like inner city inner city areas that have that already. Um, but you know, there's all a pushback because people don't want their kids having to be subjected to that. Do you feel like that's going to become necessary or do you feel like something's going to change here where we don't have to deal with this or worry about this? Well, that, that's a tough question to answer because when you look at the, uh, kind of the violence and fights that happen at schools, I would definitely advocate having some type of metal detector to prevent like knives from getting in. Um, but if, if we're doing that as a method to stop, uh, shooting situations, um, you know, if the metal detector's right in front of you and you got a gun, you know, what's to prevent somebody from shooting, you know, through the fences and things like that, you mm-hmm. know, and we hear about every single one that happens, obviously for good reason, but they, it is rare for it to happen. I mean, the saga shooting hit me personally pretty hard because my, my daughter went to that school. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so you always wonder and you hear students were killed. And, and you wonder, you know, what what personal connection do I have? But I, I don't think we should be thinking in that in that way. It's like any anyone, it's it's somebody's you know daughter, it's it's um, somebody's son, uh, and um, you you can't you know if we could predict where they were going to be, we could move extra security there, but mm-hmm. you, you just can't. And and uh, it, it's it's a fact of life in our our society. And not to say it's, it's hopeless, but, you know, I think the best thing to do is have that mental preparation about what are you going to do, educate our kids about but what, what they're going to do, what they can do if, if, they, uh, if they hear gunfire going off. And most of the school staff are trained pretty well. Mm-hmm. They, they have the, the skill set and the knowledge, uh, but when something actually happens, uh, how somebody reacts under that pressure um, there's no real predictor for that, mm-hmm. and um, there's there's been uh, tales of uh, heroic teachers that you know uh, shield kids with their bodies, and then there's also tales of of 
of school staff who who go hide uh, yeah, right. and leave yeah. their kid. Yeah. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> um, so uh, it, and you know that's that's uh, again going back to law enforcement training. That that's why we train so much in in so many mm-hmm. different ways. That that we hope when the pressure's on, when when something happens, that we're going to fall back on our training mm-hmm. yeah. and we're going to react in the right way. And um, for the civilian population. Um, you want to have that that kind of level of reaction, but you know what's the cost? You mm-hmm. know, uh, uh, mm-hmm. I've educated my kids on on kind of what to do in these situations, and you know, but I also temper that with, I, you know, it's very rare for this to happen. Um, yeah. Pay attention to your surroundings, but you know, this 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 won't happen to you. Right, kind of yeah. that because what's the use in saying? Well, it might happen to you, and then they <laughs> yeah. can't sleep for yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No. I was going to ask that what you say to them because yeah, you can't um, scare them to death. I mean, that's not worth it either, you know. But make them aware enough. Yeah, that's got to be really hard. To yeah, talk I mean, to I, kids about it. I, we I haven't had to do that yet because my kids no. are pretty pretty small still. Huh. But I've thought about what am I going to tell them because. Uh, yeah, I mean, is it kicking over? If you get to that, I'm assuming you, because your first stage was kind of just be aware of your surroundings. You can right. run if you can, hide if you can't get away. Right. And then if it comes down to the third option would be what I, I would imagine is combat or uh, attacking the shooter. Right, right. But what and kid? No kid. How's gonna a kid? How's how like, a kid gonna do that? You know, not gonna happen. Well, I don't know. You've Maybe. seen some of these kids are into martial arts. Yeah, that's and true. That's yeah. why. <laughs> Want to, you know, put your kid into into martial arts and you know dodging bullet training yeah. <laughs> is such a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the general public and and not just for kids is is you know if if you have no other option, uh, and we talked about this concept a little bit about going 100 percent on mm-hmm. somebody and you know actually hitting somebody 100 uh, percent force that that and and using whatever tools you have around you. I mean, there's so much talk about oh we should arm the teachers and and you know, but I wonder the same thing for for any profession. If somebody has the level of training and actually commits themselves to to going to the range and knowing gun safety and and um, you know that then possibly, but it's very hard to legislate that in in a school environment that you know the teachers are going to you know and then you know law enforcement we have to qualify exactly uh, mm-hmm. our department qualifies every quarter mm-hmm. you know are we going to now qualify you know oh they're you know you have these staff you know improvement days yeah. you know, they're at the range <laughs> you know so I mean nuts. I got to grade papers and go shoot some guns yeah. this weekend right you, <laughs> well, you have some cops that can barely shoot <laughs> right <laughs> right so teachers in there it's like ooh yeah. Uh, yeah, you've got the papers strange. and, you know, yeah. how many, you know, I'll shoot three times through the paper for an A <laughs> and twice. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, definitely using any weapon of opportunity. Um, in in the video that we did, uh, the, uh, the victim who's kind of trapped in a warehouse with a shooter, you know, grabs a fire extinguisher. Mm-hmm. And, um, That's good idea. and we got it, we had, a, you know, he, he actually shoots the the shooter in the face with a fire extinguisher. And, and we, you know, we were criticized for that about, oh, that would never work, you know. And, and you know, the point is, you know, impact that person's uh, senses and ability to continue, you know, wh- and maybe take the fire extinguisher and hit him in the head with it, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But realize this person has, has a gun. And, you know, there's the, the thing about, you know, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. That's essentially what we're doing. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So try, you know, try to find a way not to be even in that, in that position. But if you're barricaded in a room, the shooter comes in, um, think about uh, aggressing on that person immediately and throwing chairs, hitting them with chairs, you know, a- anything that you can, you can find. Uh, and, you know, you, you mentioned that your, your kids are, are, are little, you know, as far as preparation and what we tell our kids, it, it, we should temper it in, in terms that they understand. We're not going to tell a kindergartner, um, yeah, you know, someone could possibly come in here and, and shoot and kill you. Because even the, the <laughs> yeah. concept of, of death hopefully hasn't, you know, been a part of their, although they're, I'm probably kidding myself, they're probably uh, playing uh, Fortnite and, and <laughs> Call of Duty already. Um, but, you know, talking about kind of the concept of the bad person, you know, if somebody bad comes, we need to hide, you know, yeah. in the mm-hmm. room. And and that that's very scary, too. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we need to... to uh, Talk to our educators about what is appropriate for their level, uh, and our, all all kids are different. You know, um, uh, kids at at age thirteen, some are jaded and you know know the world and have seen everything you know in every movie and, yeah. and uh, probably real stuff. You talked about watching something about the New Zealand shooting mm-hmm. on 
the kids have seen this stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think you need to, you know, but some haven't, you know. Yeah. So just talking about how and, and really telling them it's that hard balance. We don't want to go out in the world being paranoid. We don't want, um, you know, we talk about in, in the States about our freedom. We don't want to, it's going to sound cliche, but let the terrorists win. You know, right. we don't want to let the, the, those type of inc incidents get in the way of us enjoying our lives. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it, at, at some point, you know, our, all our lives are, are going to be at an end and we, you know, want to, you want to have as much fulfillment and as much mm -hmm. positive in your life as you can. And if, if getting there means just being a little more aware about your surroundings, then, um, yeah, I want that. I want my kids to know what to do. I don't want them people to, you know, look around and go, I don't know what to do. And yeah, you know, it'll be, it seems to be a lot of people like that, you know, and yeah, that, I mean, and it's, it's scary. I mean, that just going back to that New Zealand shooting, it, I mean, people were scared. Well, I think it's a good you know, example like, too. You talked about the guy who was trying to get up to the shooter, but couldn't make it. Well, he like, was, was, I mean, using chairs, using objects to try to close the distance and maybe distract him. Because, well, the shooter was just so aggressive. Like just that's I mean, the thing is he was just that's armed just, like crazy. That's so what's scary. Is to go into a church and just start shooting people. I mean, you're not expecting that, right? You know? Well, it's like what you said about hitting someone as hard as you can. A right. lot of people don't understand that what that would feel yeah. like or be. So I don't think people understand to see aggression like that of someone killing people. What that's going to be like? I don't. I, I, I don't. I haven't. I don't think. I don't. Well, know what most like. people, there is something innate in most normal people that to not harm other people. Mm -hmm. right. And even in, in when you're in a situation like that, uh, there's part of you that doesn't want to hurt another human being, even mm -hmm. though they are, you know, killing people around you. There's, there's a, a video that, that when, when the concept of, uh, fighting and aggressing on a shooter comes up, they always refer to this video and it's a city council meeting. I don't even know what city it was, but the, the guy comes in and he's holding the city council hostage. He's holding him at gunpoint. And this woman who's probably in her late sixties, early seventies comes in and tries to you know, clock the guy in the head with her purse. <laughs> and he kind of turns around and like grabs her and, you know, throws her on the ground. And, and uh, uh, it, you know, kudos to her for, for trying, yeah. but uh, <laughs> he could have done, he could have killed her, you know. Yeah. Um, his his uh, uh, purpose was not to uh, kill people. He wanted to make a statement, you know, mm. and you're lucky about that. Um, yeah. The motivation of, unfortunately, a lot of these active shooters is to, is to kill people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, a lot of them are this random type thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one one of the things that that most law enforcement do when we go to a public place or a restaurant is is when we have a choice of where to sit, we want to sit facing the door yep. so we can see what's coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that something couldn't can come from from behind you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that scene in The Godfather when uh, yeah. <laughs> Bathroom scene. When he gets really, the, yeah. gets really what we're gun. telling everybody, there's, yeah. there's no chance. You're screwed. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they really want to. I mean, yeah. but get, Live every day like it's your last. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. True. Is there a profile to shooters these days that kind of um, law enforcement or the FBI kind of puts out there in terms of like if you see a suspicious person? Because there's so much made today of like don't profile people. Don't, you know, don't put people in little boxes. But I mean, if you right. see someone walking around with a trench coat and it's hot outside, you know, everybody's worried about being politically correct, and I, I don't. Yeah. I, it it yeah. bothers all of us who, who are thinking individuals. But mm -hmm. uh, um, I, you, you just touched on it right there. I mean, the, the stereotype in our mind is, you know, uh, you think of, um, you know, Columbine, and you know these these goth kind of, you know, somebody who's all in black and and uh, the loner. Mm -hmm. um, then you look compare that with the Saugus uh, shooter, and and there was no almost no warning signs of this guy. I mean, his post on social media was, you know, hey, Saugus, have fun tomorrow. Jeez. And he didn't, he may have been a smiley face. There wasn't like a picture of a gun or anything mm -hmm. like that. So it's, it's understanding, uh, and, and uh, forgive me, I don't know the author's name, but there's a book called The Gift of Fear. Mm -hmm. And um, it talks about there's, there's something built into human beings, a little warning sign that the hair standing up on the back of your neck and, and things like that. Pay attention to that stuff, and when when something doesn't seem right, um, pay attention to that, and don't just say, "Ah, oh, it's nothing." Um, 
I mean, some some things are so ridiculously obvious that people even don't pay attention to that. When I, when I worked patrol, there was a, and this tells you how long ago it was there was a Montgomery Wards, uh, <laughs> I uh, that. yeah, you know, um, <laughs> a store, and there was a like a jewelry case, mm-hmm. and uh, in the summer, four guys came in in long coats, pulled out baseball bats, mm-hmm. and smashed the uh, uh, the cases to to get the jewelry. And people saw them coming in. And they went, huh, that's odd. But and before they did it, nobody picked up a phone and dialed 911. Uh, you know, another thing I'd say is yeah. police get false alarms and, and odd calls all the time. If you see somebody who doesn't look like they belong, I'm not going to get into the, the, the you know, racial profiling. If somebody, if you live in a neighborhood and somebody's sitting in their car in front of somebody's house and something doesn't seem right, call the police. They'll come out, they'll talk to the individual, and if they say, oh, I know Jeff who lives right here, I'm just waiting for him to come home, and they'll get their information, and then they're not going to, you know, yank the guy out of the car and beat him to a— well, they might. <laughs> <laughs> but police exactly, respond though. to calls of—I you know, mean, how many calls have you responded to a suspicious person? Oh, yeah, it's like all you the know? time now. So all the time. understanding that that's, it's okay to call— uh, and report something like that because later on, if something does happen, you're like, ah, I, yeah, I saw yeah. that guy, but you know. So realizing, seeing things that that seem out of the ordinary to you, and um, and reporting it is the best best way to go. Okay. Um, you know, um, there are some states out there that, that are um, uh, open carry, mm-hmm. and if you see somebody look suspicious, you know, I wouldn't suggest in one of those states you just start blasting them. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, that's a whole other topic, but, uh, just be aware of your surroundings without being paranoid. Um, understand when something looks out of the ordinary, the, the perfect example is it's in the middle of the summer and somebody's wearing a coat, uh, um, somebody, you know, trying not to be identified, somebody wearing, you know, dark glasses at night. Mm -hmm. Um, although a lot of people do that to be cool, uh, (laughs) Uh, just realizing that and just just pointing it out to somebody, or in the very least, just just uh, you know, make sure your family is safe. If you're walking out, you know, the dads are supposed to be the protectors. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. and I talk to my wife about this a lot when we're down, um, you know, walking on the street, you know, or or just keeping your peripheral vision. I mean, this is one of the first skills that cops develop mm-hmm. that you didn't have before. I mean, the first couple of weeks of patrol, my neck was killing it's me because like, you're yeah, constantly forth, scanning. Yeah. And and it's not to the point of paranoia. It's it's just like uh, if if you're about to walk past an area where there's a uh, a doorway that's inset or there's a uh, like a bush, um, as you walk by, turn just turn your head mm-hmm. and see is there somebody over there? Not you know expecting somebody to be there. Or if you see somebody that you walk by in the street, look to your to your to either side that they're on, and just use your peripheral vision to see are they did they start following. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just it's kind of a skill that everybody should have, um, yeah. just being aware. Uh, and um, uh, you know, we've got a, a very liberal uh, state and city when it comes to homeless people. I you know I, I sympathize with their plight of being homeless, but there's a lot of the people that are out on the street don't want to be in the shelters because exactly. there's rules in the shelters. Mm-hmm. There's uh, you know, and people want to do. Uh, you know, addicts who are, are homeless want to continue to use drugs. Mm-hmm. And it's a shame, you know, it's it, it's it's really bad for them. But, you know, your family has to, you know, my daughter had to walk to school right by kind of in a homeless encampment. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, you know, I don't, I didn't want to tell her these people are dangerous. It's like, there are some people in the homeless population that have uh, addiction and mental illness and, and they, they can't control kind of their behavior and just being aware of that and just being cautious. Yeah. And if mm-hmm. somebody starts to walk towards you, they may – sure, they may be asking you for money or something like that. But they could have other other motivation and, yeah. and uh, just, you know, be ready to run or react or, you know, just like those other things we talked about. Yeah. Just one uh, – it was like Christmas Eve and I was walking. There was a uh, adult male walking around and he just kept looking up at me at the stoplight. And it was an un, like healthy – relationship we were having like he just kept like, looking like at what, me what, what he mentioned is like, like your hair stood up or like yeah i'm like he shouldn't where... be looking at me this much like right look at me w- maybe once or twice and move on but then he turned the corner walked down the street and i ended up stopping him and uh just consensual stop like hey what's up and i kind of kept it very very casual like oh, you almost, were on duty yeah yeah i was okay. on duty and um 
just popped open my door. I'm like, Hey, you want to just chat for a minute? And I was like half in the car and right. my partner came up and he started, and he was ended up being on parole and talked to me a little more, but he was acting even weirder and messing with his like jacket and his right. pockets. And I'm like, I mean, he has drugs. Like cause a lot of, everybody has drugs now. Right, it seems right. like. And, uh, we we're like, nope, we're going to cuff him up. So we put him in cuffs and he ended up having a gun loaded Glock in his pants. And, Crazy. uh, I was like, oh man, like I didn't really suspect that. Like, you know, right. you always suspect, okay, maybe I have a weapon or maybe something, but. And, and that's the fear. I think all of us in law enforcement have, especially us in, in supervision that, that our, our, uh, our partners are going to hesitate mm -hmm. based on a fear of litigation or, or, uh, you know, being called a racist. Yep. And one thing to understand is we're never going to change the mind of somebody who's convinced that all cops are, are racist. Um, right. and, and, uh, I would much rather, uh, deal with a complaint or a lawsuit than, uh, not act, uh, out of, out of caution or, or whatever. And in your situation, that could yeah. have gone horribly wrong. Oh, absolutely. You and know. it was humbling in a way afterward, you know, because it could have been, like you said, so bad in so many ways. And, you know, a lot of guys have guns and stuff, but you just, it's just the way, I mean, luckily we were aware enough to what, how he was acting where we were kind of like, okay, you know, maybe. Yeah. If he decided to pull it out and start shooting, then you have a yeah. whole nother, you know what I mean? Well, he didn't, just... he did not have one in the chamber because that, uh, you know, he didn't want to blow. Yeah. Off didn't want to blow, <laughs> blow, <off> his, <laughs> blow something off. off his nuts or anything. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we had to jump on him there, but. I mean, there's a whole segment of the population that think that, that police should, uh, somebody should shoot at them first. Before yeah. They return. It's just fire. <laughs> Like, yeah. or I had one lady say, what? Shoot the gun out of their hand, Yeah, like, right? shoot him in the arm. Like, yeah. what? Yeah. How do you... I had somebody ask me that once. Can't you just disarm him? Yeah. What? Or like, or, yeah. or like in a car chase, you're shooting tires and stuff, which oh, I think is going to be silliness. done, but it's like, yeah. it's normal guy's not doing that. Normal <laughs> cop's not doing that. Usually it doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. So do you see this problem changing at all? I mean, what do you see? I know like it's in the kind of politics and stuff, and I don't know how comfortable you are doing that, but... Is this the new norm? I, I hope the pendulum swings back a little bit. I mean, I, I, I've seen the the change of things out after Rodney King. And, and as I mentioned, a, a lot for the better. I mean, we, we never had community policing before in, you know, going back to the 80s. And, and, and community policing really, it's kind of what the cop on the beat used to do, get to know the people in the neighborhood. And, and you know, again, it goes back to our, our topic of communication and just being, talking to people mm -hmm. and getting to know uh, who they are, uh, spending uh, some amount of time working in the jails uh, and just talking to to the players and uh, and hearing about, you know, their mindset. And, and you know, I, I, I always... I, I'm fond of calling it like the cartoon where you've got the the wolf and the sheepdog, and they come. They they're all, "Hey, how <laughs> yeah. was your weekend, Bob?" You know, and then they cl they clock in, yeah. and then it's game on. Um, <laughs> just understanding it's it's not personal, but I, I don't. I, I really hope that um, that the public realizes because we're having a, a a crisis in law enforcement of lack of ability to recruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, we have the ability to recruit, but just finding people that want to be cops nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's a, it's, you know, and it's a, it's a self perpetuating problem where the, the, the people who we want to be cops, the, the, you know, people who are really, um, you know, truly are, are looking to do good and to help mm -hmm. people don't want to be cops because of the negative, uh, kind of connotation that that's, that's been the norm over the, you know, yeah. and it's building, you know, it kind of came to a peak when uh, the officers in Baton Rouge and Dallas were mm -hmm. were were murdered, mm -hmm. were were you know s sniped at and 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 killed just for wearing the uniform. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was you know, it, and all of them are tragedies, but you know, there was a cop in New York who who was was killed, and uh, they got into his background, and th here was a guy who used to. He would get off duty and he'd go into the impoverished areas around where he worked and he would buy the kids ice cream and he'd play games with them. He'd play basketball with them and hang out in the neighborhood. And, and that's that's who we want all cops to be like. We can't yeah. require them to do that. But this guy was killed in, in – and they're all senseless, but, you know, killed in the line of duty and really hurt that community. Uh, and, and you wish that, you know, that – before the trigger got pulled by the suspect, he really knew, you know, instead of seeing just the uniform, mm -hmm. seeing the person. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that eventually, uh, you know, people who kind of have that negative opinion would just, 
and they've got these programs now, you know, have coffee with a cop, or, yeah. you know, and, mm-hmm. and they're able to sit down. And, and unfortunately, these programs are mostly in, in uh, communities that don't need that. Exactly. Like, yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. Areas. I saw yeah. one in Redondo Beach. Right. Have right. coffee with yeah. a cop. And I was <laughs> like, like I'm sure, sure. Some you know? people will. <laughs> and donuts. Um, yeah. yeah. But, you know, you're never going to, you know, one of the, one of the best stories I've heard is, is somebody who was a anti-police activist. And um, somehow he got introduced and put in through the uh, kind of shooting simulation, shoot, don't shoot training. And um, he ended up shooting the suspect um, and and not having a justification for it. And they put him through, you know, several trainings. And he, he actually had a, a bit of a change of heart. He said, you know, I, yeah, this is tough. I didn't realize mm-hmm. yeah. that, you know, the dangers, um, you know, I, and, and it changed his viewpoint. And I, I think the, the people that need their viewpoint changed, um, not to say everyone must think this way, um, to have that connection and, and uh, opportunity to get to know really what law enforcement's about, yep. uh, won't do it, won't mm-hmm. take that step. And, you know, part of the problem is is we're human beings. Every profession has the worst of whatever that profession is. Exactly. Yeah. And the job of, of law enforcement tends to attract you know, aggressive mm-hmm. uh, people, and we've got some bad eggs. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you don't hear about the thousand positive stories. You hear about the negative one exactly. of the the cop who shot somebody who's unarmed, and and that's a whole other topic. But I think that training, law enforcement gets a, a certain amount of training. You have to have an individual that is confident in the training that they're given mm-hmm. and confident in their verbal skills. Uh, and is able to channel the fear that is inherent in every human being right. and channel that into um, really reacting to a situation in the right way. We aren't robots, and we do have people who aren't confident yep. in their physical skills and in, in their, their training and experience, and and um, and bad things happen. You know, you, you yeah. couple that kind of a, a person who's maybe not the best skilled with somebody who is uncooperative— and pushes it to the limit, mm-hmm. and that's a recipe for, you know, a lot of the things that we hear going on in the news. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, disaster. And, the, and like you said, it's so hard to find people now. That the people that really want it, some of them that want to do this job now aren't the ones you really want <laughs> right. to do this job. <laughs> right. You're like, mm. yeah. You know, well, it's, it's just unfortunate, but, and yeah, you hit all the points, though. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, that's well said, and it's kind of sad, but to come full cir- circle again back to the mass shootings and— yeah. I guess asking the same question, I mean, do you see this, the new norm for mass shootings, and do you see it changing? And again, it gets political with gun laws. and Right, right. I, I actually had a meeting with some school, um, uh, with some teachers, uh, and uh, being in the in the business of, of making public service announcements and, you know, talking about what, you know, where where are these shootings coming from and why are they there? And there's there's a whole segment of people who say, Video games are, you know, partially to blame. Social media is partly to blame. And and let's say they are. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think they are in, in their entirety, but we're not going to get rid of those things. Right. We're not going to get rid of video games because, you know, look how much money they make. Yeah. We're not going to get rid of social media. And it's, it's horrible, and it's probably the cause of a lot of teen suicides out there. We're not going to get rid of that. So really the, the, the key, I think— and it really speaks to the, your your podcast is 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 the family, and and really having uh, a, a close knit family and talking to your kids about what is important, uh, understanding that it's more important to have a good relationship with your family than getting a like on <laughs> yeah. on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's a hard. I mean, I, you know, I try to think about you know when I went to high school in the in the early eighties and and. And, you know what was important to me, and it was—it really was, you know, having good friends and 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 interacting with them. But that was also the time where we'd go out and play in the neighborhood mm-hmm. and get exactly. into fights with people. And we didn't have games where we were pulling, you know, constantly shooting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You'd, you'd brush each other off and and you know yell at each other, and then two days later you're back playing football or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. you know, I think trying to have relationships. With and, and cultivating those good relationships with your 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 family and and your friends from an early age might change the tide, but it you know we don't. It, it, the, the teachers we were meeting with were talking about how, unfortunately, 
the, the some of the parents who don't do that, they're relying on the schools to raise their kids. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and then you bring that up to to when they're an adult, and and a lot of those parents who maybe even aren't in the picture uh, are looking, at, maybe not intentionally, but law enforcement ends up caring for them mm-hmm. in the jail system. Yeah, and that's even worse. <laughs> You know, it's nobody like, looks at their fourth grader and says, yeah, you know, I, I want them to go to jail uh, <laughs> when they're, when, and you may feel like it at some point, but, <laughs> but um, the key to that not happening is, is having that, that tight relationship with, you know, especially fathers and sons um, mm-hmm. and, and not yeah. exclusively boys, but, but if you look at our mass shootings, they're almost exclusively boys and, and, uh, yeah. and a lot of the gang yeah. problem is as is a result of not having a male figure mm-hmm. uh, and role model in their life. So, so um, not to downplay the importance of women, um, but really that that being the leader of a family and being being the father uh, and and connecting with your child and having them come to you, yeah. uh, they're still gonna when they get to a certain age gonna think you're stupid <laughs> and all that stuff, and then that kind of yeah. goes away in their twenties, hopefully. <laughs> uh, well, even you see some. Girl, like the women that are in custody too, like they don't have dads, right? You know, like their fathers are. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them you hear, there's like they'll talk about their stories and how they're either their dad abused them or uh, or he or they uh, were in prison or they never none not one of them has like a great a family. good family story. No. Yeah, right. So I've you don't think it'll be that. something legislated? You think it's going to have to come Families, more from like yeah. family type? Yeah, it's got to. I mean, yeah, our. So. our <laughs> Yeah. Not to get political, but one of the reasons I want to leave California is yeah. you know, the legislatures. That's a mess. It's they're lost. You know. Also, you know, there's so much. Um, you know, you look at colleges and and liberal colleges and, and how they they really have forgotten about the freedoms that we've uh, our our you know fathers and and grandfathers fought for about you know freedom of speech. That's even gone away. Where you can't speak your mind if it's if it's against what a certain group thinks. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. And, and I was, you know, going back to talking about communication being important, uh, I would rather talk to somebody and find out where they're coming from and understand what their their deal is rather than saying, no, I, I'm not going to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like now, it's like if you don't agree with them, <clears throat> especially like right. the really far left, like they'll just shut you out. Yeah. Like there's yeah. no listening to you. There's no reasoning. No. It's absurd. Why it's like, compromise? Like I'll listen to you and hear what you have to say. But I won't, it's just, it's so bizarre. Sad. Right. It's like Twilight Zone almost, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. To, to, to end it on a really positive note. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody hates each other and there's nothing you can do. That's right. <laughs> um, any last questions before we wrap it no, up? Oh, that was great. Yeah, that did you, I guess to recap it, maybe, so the biggest thing is um, run, hide, fight would be well we can't use that one that's not the one but yeah well, i think you can now <laughs> we can say it got to a point where it's and now it's you it's know. Ever universal yeah okay. yeah the best best way to deal with the situation is not to be there in the first place mm-hmm. uh and um uh you know again we're, we're talking about you know gun laws and things like that that that's not going away anytime soon so no. and and there's a whole segment who think that okay if you if you legislate and believe that that guns should should not be around and you know the bad people are going to have how many mm-hmm. how many know. illegal guns and guns with serial numbers scraped off you yep. have, have we pulled off the street and those are just the ones that we encounter and find mm-hmm. um, so guns aren't going away um and um uh, you know i was asked by a neighbor the other day who who was you know having a problem with somebody if if uh, she thought i i she should get a gun and uh you know personally and i'm a little odd for law enforcement um I, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest that people do that as a ways of protection uh, uh, because it can be used against you and exactly. so much can go wrong. And, and uh, you know, you look at people who have uh, – what's the thing they say? If you end up shooting someone in your yard, drag them in the house. Yeah. Make, sure, <laughs> make sure you're you're covered as far as protecting yourself. Any last words from anybody? But anything that uh, people, if they wanted more information about this or if they want to do some reading, would you kind of guide them toward? Or is this kind of something that's – I don't know. I mean, it's just in the news every day. Is there any kind of like actual practical things people could look at if there's they're concerned a, I, about there's it? There's a lot of uh, uh, stuff on YouTube, like anything else. Um, and so just, you know, searching run, hide, fight or, or um, uh, surviving an active shooter and, and, and just taking, you know, and there's a lot of bad information out there. So just uh, look at it with with that kind of an eye that uh, take what's what's going to work and be effective for you and your family. 
Uh, first of all, if, if it's something that you really think is important, share it with friends. Uh, and, you know, what you hope will happen is, is that somebody will learn something down the line. And God forbid, if, if somebody you know or, or a family member or even somebody that, you know, three generations down, down the line of, of you told somebody, they told somebody else, if they learn something that ends up helping them uh, survive an incident uh, or get out of one before it even happens, uh, then, then it's all worth it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's well good said. Good words. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Appreciate my it. pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Have, let's all have a great rest of our day now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Later. Good weekend. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Sergeant Harry Drucker and how to survive a mass shooting. Hit us up, Tim, on Instagram, uh, Tim O'Hara25. Twitter is JT O'Hara25. I'm SCO24 on Instagram and Twitter. Please hit us up. Send us the email podcast at dadsdoomsdayguide.com. Podcast at dadsdoomsdayguide.com. Thanks, everybody. Stay sexy. Stay safe. Thank you for listening. Bye. You've been listening to the Dad's Doomsday Guide. So enlightening. I loved it. Get more episodes and videos at themadmachinist.com. Superb. Oh, hell yeah.